the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco was built. It was the largest suspension bridge in the world at the time and still is the third largest. This was the bridge which many had said couldn't and some had said shouldn't be built when it was first proposed in 1923. But 129,000 kilometers of steel wire, 83,000 tons of steel, and 15 years later, Golden Gate Bridge designer Joseph B. Strauss had proved them all wrong. In 1937, he gave the very last rivet made of gold to Edwin Ironhorse Stanley to install in the bridge. The Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco has become an icon of the 20th century bridge builder's art and currently over 100,000 cars cross it every day, 10 times more than when it opened. But only a few hundred miles up the Pacific coast from here, Tacoma Narrows, stands another more chilling icon for bridge builders. Built at practically the same time as the Golden Gate, the first Tacoma Narrows Bridge was to prove to be a step into the unknown. The design of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was, in a sense, an exceptional design because the bridge uh, was very narrow in comparison to its length. It was a bridge in which the ratio of length uh, to width was among the largest uh, in the world. And it was designed by Leon Moseyev, who at the time was by far the greatest designer of suspension bridges. He had done uh, extremely original work on the effect of wind on such bridges. And it was inaugurated with great glee and joy by the governor of uh, Washington state. But soon after being built, it began oscillating. The oscillations quickly earned the bridge the nickname Galloping Gertie. Most of the time the undulations were gentle and traffic continued to be allowed across. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge was in fact a very advanced design. And when you make such a technological jump, you run a risk of having overseen something. So every time you make a long extrapolation of technology, you have to watch out in particularly uh, very carefully uh, in order to make sure that you have also seen what you cannot see. And in this particular case, the aeroelastic problem became a dominant one. Galloping Gertie's aeroelastic problem became so famous that whenever the wind speed and direction were right, tourists would come from far and wide to watch her do her usual act. But then, one windy November morning, she decided to change that act. What happened on the day the bridge collapsed in 1940 was a totally unexpected phenomenon. The bridge began uh, undulating, then all of a sudden switched from an undulating mood into a twisting mood in which half the bridge would have the right side go up and the left side go down, while the left side of the bridge would do just the opposite. And it was this twisting oscillation, uh, which increase with time under a steady wind of 40 miles an hour. The bridge had been closed to traffic about half an hour before Gertie had begun her new turn, and all but one car had made it safely off the bridge. The car was Leonard Cotesworth's, and in it, apart from him, was his daughter's dog, Tubby. Both Leonard and Tubby were becoming increasingly distressed by the actions of the bridge, but only Leonard had the sense to stagger away to safety. The terrified Tubby could not be extricated from the bucking Buick, and he became immortalized as the only direct casualty of Gertie's demise. But perhaps as another indirect casualty, the bridge's designer, Leon Moiseev. Moiseev uh, died of a heart attack six months later, 
And when he was asked originally, do you have an explanation for what happened? He said, I have no idea of why the bridge collapsed. He was totally justified. The engineers decided to build a scaled-down version of Gertie in the wind tunnel to see whether they could replicate her unusual behaviour patterns. Why, they wanted to know, had the bridge changed from the relatively benign undulations which occurred most of the time to the twisting motion which was to prove so disastrous? Explanations were offered right after the collapse of the bridge which did not make much sense and it was only 52 years later, in 1992, that the first two explanations by two different uh, scientists were proposed, which make complete sense, because what was found was that the wind had produced uh, what is known as a special type of von Karman vortex. A von Karman vortex happens whenever the wind moves away from a structure, creating a vacuum. And it may create a vacuum on one side of the bridge and then on another side of the bridge. And if this sucking on either side of the bridge occurs in resonance, meaning with the same period, in rhythm with the twisting oscillation of the bridge, then the bridge will collapse. Uh, this kind of common vortices had never been found before. It was a new phenomenon. And I don't believe that anybody can blame the designer or anybody else if it took 52 years to find out why the Tacoma Nelson Bridge collapsed.